May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer. I've been tired and tired, a strong enough word, exhausted, empty, tired, spent. Any of them and all of them could easily apply. Now, know that this is a new thing. For me. If anything, I'm always full of energy. You could argue, Brian, calm down. You're at an 11, we need you down at a five. Why are you this way? I've heard all of them. And yet, right about the time I received my first vaccination, I hit a wall. Suddenly, I couldn't rally the energy to do the simplest of tasks, let alone engage in the creative energy needed to write not one, but two books that were due, still are due, uh, months ago. Since that time, I've realized that I've been adapting. I've been past year. And if I'm energetic, I am doubly adaptable. I know how to pivot. I know how to react, to chart a new course, to roll with the punches. But this was a year surviving a global pandemic. And I was tired. Now, perhaps some of you are feeling the same way. Today's gospel passage is unique, not only for what it tells us, which we'll get to momentarily, but also what it doesn't tell us. Its own, We would see Jesus ministering to the disciples after they've returned from their first preaching mission. And Jesus wants to know how things went. He knows that they're tired. They've given their all. And they're likely ready to keep moving, to keep seeing what Jesus would do next. And if we follow this story through Mark, the very two next passages are exactly that. Jesus feeding the 5,000 on water. Things are about to happen. But instead of hurrying them to the next mission, instead of pressing them to keep up with the work of the kingdom of God, Jesus forces them to pause. He asks them to sit back, have a meal, and share some stories. But as we find in the passage, they can't find true rest. People excited about Jesus, about what was happening, the chance to be healed, beat them to their first spot. This great crowd, and we're told it's people from an entire region, sick. They begged to touch the, just the fringe of Christ's cloak. They believed in the healing power of God. The passage tells us that Christ had compassion for them because they were, quote, like a sheep without a shepherd. Now, the image of Christ as a shepherd isn't likely to surprise many of us. God as shepherd, as we see in Jeremiah reading from today, and then again in Psalm 23, was a common metaphor for how God cares for us. Many academic pages have been spent unpacking this metaphor, but if I were to boil it down to a simple thought, I might choose this. We will never be in want, and we shall not bow down to fear. Now, it's possible to read these passages a different way. Many, if not all, scholars read these passages through a political lens, interpreting them as critiques of the leaders during a time of great upheaval. On a different day the sermon that I preach, in a time we are not trudging through a global pandemic to remember what it's like to be together in ways that used to be normal, that might be what catches my interest. And teaching professor at Vanderbilt Divinity School would likely chastise me for the surface level of exegesis I'm about to use to engage these passages. I simply can't see it another way. Not now. Maybe not now when these passages come around again in the lectionary. Perhaps never. And the reason for this is we've all been through something traumatic. I'm going to say that again. We have all been traumatic. And right now, even though I think it's legitimate to hope that we are coming out on the other side of this pandemic, it's important to realize that we're still through something traumatic. So listen again to today's passages in that light. They hit different. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall feel no evil. For you are with me, your staff, they comfort me. And then from the Jeremiah passage. I will raise up shepherds over them 
who will sh and they will shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing. This is the word of God calling us to rest, calling us to take a break from our labors. It's a reminder that or not, we're not meant to grind ourselves into an oblivion. Throughout the Bible, God invites us into moments of rest and again, to places where we can find the abundance of life outside of working, outside of worldly pressures that tell us that we must do more. Theologian and biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann tells us, Sabbath provides a visible testimony that God is at the center of life, that human production and consumption save the world ordered, blessed, and restrained by the God of all creation. Now to unpack that and put it in a different way, Sabbath or taking rest is an acknowledgement that our life is not defined by work or by pro productivity. Similarly, Abraham writes, humans are not a beast of burden and the Sabbath is not the purpose for the purpose of enhancing the efficiency of their work. Again, those quotes might be for a sermon from a different, for a different time, a different sermon. But today, when I reflect on these passages, when I listen to what those quotes are saying, I'm not thinking about our over I'm not thinking about the dichotomy of a capitalist definition of security compared to God's invitation to abundance. Instead, I look at those passages, I hear those quotes, and I ask, how do we heal? How do we enter into Sabbath? Now, it's okay to this, but when we lived in Oregon, I was really into hot yoga. I've never been what you call flexible. I don't have a yoga body. But something about the practice spoke to me, especially in those long, rainy winter months, and I was obsessed with it. But as much as I liked it, whenever we were asked to go into sav savasana, which is the dead body pose, I would immediately get fidgety. Now, if you're not familiar, savasana is where you just lay down on the mat. That's it. You just lay there. And again, for a person with a significant amount of energy, so it's tedious. Now, if this was a good sermon illustration, I would transition into how eventually I learned the power of savasana. I learned the power of controlling my breath, quieting my mind, finding a peace. But that never happened. The last savasana was arguably just as challenging as the first one. Once the teacher turned off the lights, the mental countdown started on when it would be appropriate for me to stand up, roll up my mat, and leave. And yet, as I thought about Sabbath, I couldn't help but be reminded of the sheer diligence we sometimes show in our ability to res resist something that is good for us. Or to put it differently, in our ability to remain wounded, and to, to believe the lie that we do not need, or perhaps even deserve, healing. Some of us faced devastating losses during the pandemic. Some of us weathered it with little to no consequences. But no, as we begin to re redefine what normal looks like, none of us are coming out of this unaffected. And so again, much to the chagrin of Vanderbilt preaching professors everywhere, Jesus being the shepherd for today. Throughout the gospel, Jesus centers ministry on the needs of people, consistently challenging systems, both religious and cultural. Ironically, this even includes violating the law of not working on the Sabbath. Jesus is not concerned about legalities, about doing religion the right way, especially if that means living in want, if that means the valley of the shadow of death. Instead, Jesus invites us to cool pastures where we can find rest, healing. He invites us to get away from the needs of the crowd, to sit together, to tell our stories. He dares us to believe in true abundance, to follow him even when it seems incongruent with the world, so that we might no longer live in fear and darkness. Hey, for me, it's hearing Jesus speak through the noise of our anxiety, our trauma, words that we desperately need to hear now, perhaps more than ever. It's him saying, sit, rest, heal. Amen.